recording has start started. Hello okay. and walk. Hello and welcome to another episode of Silk and Steel podcast. I'm your host Carl Zod. Today we have a very special guest, Peter Turchin. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself, Peter? Because I'm sure you would, you would do a much better job. Um, well, I'm um, I'm a scientist. I started my career as a theoretical biologist, but about 25 years ago, I switched into historical social science that we call Clio Dynamics from Clio, the Muse of History. So essentially, um, what I'm doing is I'm a, a complexity I'm a complexity scientist who studies the history of uh, large scale human societies. Um, and you, I actually have been following you and your work on on your blog, and you, you, the, you, the, I'm very glad that your uh, your people reach out to me on the internet and sent me your latest yet to be published book, End Time. No, no, it's published. It came out two oh. days ago. Oh, two days ago. Okay, I'm already behind. See, um, so I read it. I, I I read it in one day, and this this stuff is like catnip to me. I mean, this is my crack because your 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 book actually studies the rise and fall of uh, or you know the, the 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 oscillations of large complex societies. And this is a question that actually has bothered or or fascinated Chinese scholars for centuries. Because China, having a, such a long history, uh, it's very obvious um, to everyone that the dynastic cycles, every two to three hundred years, there will be a, a cataclysmic collapse, and then uh, society is being put in together again, and then you go through the cycle. And, and it's a, almost an obsession for the Chinese intellectia on why this happens and how to prevent it from happening. And, and in fact, in 1945, uh, a famous Chinese uh, educator, um, he went to um, Huang Yanpei, who act, who's actually a part of the 1911 Chinese Revolution to overthrow the last imperial Chinese dynasty. Uh, but in 1945, he went to uh, Yan'an, the communist base, to meet with Mao right after the Japanese surrender. And he posed a question to Mao. He said, look, you know, we looking through Chinese history, there's many rise and falls of dynasties. Um, how do we prevent that from happening? How do we how do we get out of that cyclical cycle? And Mao famously said the answer is democracy. You know, if we give masses, if we make masses the true master of destiny, then we will get out of that cycle forever. Now, many people both then and now interpreted Mao's saying as he's talking about American style electoral democracy. And the conclusion is that, okay, Mao is obviously lying. He, he's just trying to win over the Chinese liberals for the incoming Chinese civil war. Uh, but the, the question itself about uh, why it, the, the, the cyclical, the cyclical violence happens. And, and, and this is, this is stuff that, I'm personally interested in because I, I'm a lover of history. And when I find your work, I find that not only are you a historian, but you're actually a pro applying a scientific approach to history, which I find a, a refreshing and amazing because um, before a lot of what's be presented as social sciences and, or political science in the United States, I don't feel like they're real science. <laughs> I remember when I came to US when I was a uh, 13 year old, you know, I take social science classes in history uh, in class. I'm looking at it. I'm like, this is just history. There's a word science in the social science part. And so, uh, so yeah, I'm very excited. I, I, I read the whole book. It's, it's a page turner. But um, why, why, why don't you tell us more about your work and, and, and your, your latest book? Sure. Um, so uh, the Chinese history is a great um, run to illustrate these ideas, but it turns out that um, the dynastic cycles or something very similar to dynastic cycles is a characteristic of all uh, large scale complex human societies organized as states, which had um, arisen about 5000 years ago. In fact, all those uh, societies tend to uh, 
um, enjoy some periods of internal peace and order, maybe a, a century long, sometimes shorter, sometimes longer, but eventually they all, at least in the past, they all get into end times, periods of social dysfunction, political uh, disintegration, and often, uh, and with a variety of outcomes, you can talk about that because it is not mm, foreordained that a collapse would happen. Collapse does happen, but it's but it is only one of possible outcomes. So examples, more recent examples, include not only Chinese Revolution, but in fact a much more, much worse period in the Chinese history, which is the Taiping Rebellion. So we can talk about that later on, uh, because it may not be as familiar to, um, let's say, our li listeners as, uh, let's say, the French Revolution, Ru Russian Revolution, and the American Civil War. I talk about all those uh, periods of uh, social disintegr uh, uh, social political disintegration in my book, End Times. So the big question is why? And what we found in the analysis of um, uh, now approaching 200 societies, past societies entering into crisis and then emerging uh, from it, that a common theme is elite overproduction. Essentially, it is when there are too many elite wannabes vying for a fixed number of pos positions in power. All right. So, uh, in my book, I use the, uh, an example of a game such as a musical chairs game in which except and in, in, instead of removing chairs, you keep the number of chairs constant, but you keep increasing the number of players. So some competition is good, but when competition becomes very excessive, then uh, then things start breaking down. So you can imagine you start with maybe 15 people playing this game, then 20 people, 30 people, 40 people, there are four players for each chair. And so very soon uh, one or uh, more players decide to start breaking rules in order to win the game. And this is a good, um, uh, it's a good um, model for what happens in real societies that experience this elite overproduction. Because uh, the more elite uh, aspirants you have vying for these positions, the more losers the game creates. And many of those are uh, become angry, discontented, and then uh, decide that they uh, want to get ahead in the game by attacking the, uh, you know, the a governing uh, regime, essentially, so they turn into counter elites, revolutionaries, radicals, and so on. So think about uh, Lenin Bolsheviks, uh, Mao's uh, uh, communists, um, um, uh, uh, Castro, Fidel Castro's Los Barbudos, and many other examples of such counter elites. So. Um, we are uh, in the United States, we have entered this crisis period already. And so the big question is now, it's too late to avoid crisis. We are in crisis, but the big question becomes what, how it all will end. Yes, that's what I want to find out too. As a matter of fact, uh, for the last month, me and a group of friends, we have been running this long Twitter space, trying to figure out what's, What's going on in the United States? I mean, there's, it's obvious to everyone something is wrong, uh, but we're trying to you know, get in, in, into the weeds of it. What went wrong? But you actually cover this on a macro scale. You, 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 you look at this as, a, you know, as not individuals who are pushing for the change, but rather the, the collective um, actions of the, all these, what you call elite aspirants, um, on the on the system as a whole, and you, in fact, your last book, um, uh, your previous book, actually predicted the turbulent turbulent twenties. the twenty, and, and the twenty twenty start with a ban, of course. You know, we got the January six, and and so uh, you know, I'm interested. You know, it's part particular. I think a lot of my listeners, well, on you know, what is going on in the United States, 
and what we could look forward to in the future. I think that you, you devote a whole chapter, you know, chapter eight, where you talk about uh, how your model will predict um, about, about U.S. Can you talk a little bit about, about the, the predictions, model predictions? Yes, sure. Um, well, um, but uh, so I wrote an article which was published in 2010 which had this forecast that uh, by 20, in the next decade is going to be a period of increasing social political instability. All right, so that's what I said. So let's um, unpack this. Uh, where did this uh, prediction come from? First of all, I want to say that um, I'm not um, a, um, uh, you know, uh, I don't know the future. I write, I'm not uh, Harry Seldon, if you know who I'm talking about. Uh, what uh, prediction is limited? Um, first of all, in my view, I have used prediction as uh, in a sense of scientific prediction, because I, by that point in 2010, I already had, a, uh, there was a theory uh, that, ex that explained why um, societies get into these end times. And I wanted to test the theory, and the best way to test whether the theory is correct is, is using it to make predictions. So that was my ma major motivation. I was not trying to say that this, uh, you know, we have going to have doom and gloom and so on and so forth. I just wanted to see how good is the, our theory in capturing the most important parts of the uh, system dynamics. Secondly, uh, we, there's some uh, some things are not predictable. For example, don't ask me to predict who is going to be in the presidency in the United <laughs> States in 2024. All right. So the theory is, as you said, it's much more macro level. The theory looks at what are the structural trends. We can talk about, I've already mentioned elite overproduction. We can talk about popular immiseration. So these are the major trends that explain why societies get into uh, trouble, essentially. And these tr uh, this, um, structural trends tend to develop slowly and fairly predictably, all right? Whereas when an actual revolution or civil war breaks down, it is usually a result of collaboration between those structural trends and some very unpredictable triggers. So if you think about the Arab Spring, self-immolation of uh, fruit vendor Boazizi, what was what triggered it? This is something that uh, it is very difficult and probably impossible to predict if you, especially if you believe that humans have a free will, which I do. All right, so it's a combination of those uh, things. So we some things that can be predicted um, and forecast in the future. Others are very unpredictable, and you have to work with uh, such limitations. In any case, um, so uh, where did this um, uh, prediction uh, in 2010 uh, came from? I've been, uh, I and my colleagues have been studying um, past societies getting into crisis. In fact, now we have uh, we have a, a crisis DB crisis database where when I wrote the book, we had uh, we, we analyzed the first 100 societies. Now it's approaching 200 societies uh, sliding into crisis and coming out of it. So now we can get both statistics and um, also we can start uh, testing the different explanations. Well, we have already started testing the different explanations about why societies get into crisis. As I said, the most uh, uh, common theme, in fact, it's ubiquitous, is elite overproduction. The second uh, very frequent uh, occurrence is what we call elite, what we call popular immiseration. So let me explain that. Let's use the example of uh, United States. Um, up until 1970s in the United States, we had really uh, a long period of unprecedented broadly based well-being. It's often called the glorious 30 years from 1945 to 1975. During this time, worker wages grew together with uh, the economy. And then during the late 1970s, they stopped growing. The economy continued uh, going up but the wages stagnated and even declined. 
And all that uh, extra wealth that was created by workers, it had to go somewhere. It did not go to the state, which kept the pretty constant uh, proportion of GDP. It went to the economic elites. All right. So what happened was that essentially a perverse wealth pump was turned on, which started pump pumping wealth from the workers to the uh, economic elites. Now, that is bad uh, for the stability of societies because you first of all create large, the, uh, the majority of the population is getting immiserated. And this immiseration is a very real thing. We know about, for example, the deaths of despair, especially after 2000, it became very clear the suicide rates increased, uh, alcoholism uh, abuse and drug abuse. Uh, and those were all expressions of uh, a malaise, you know, affecting large uh, swaths of the American population, especially the 60% of workers, working class, um, though people who don't have a college degree. All right, so that's, that's one of the forces underlying the forecast. <clears throat> the second one is, uh, this is obvious one. The other less subtle, the other one more subtle effect is uh, the overproduction of wealthy individuals. This wealth had flown to a class of uh, newly wealthy people. And suddenly, if you look at uh, uh, very rich people who have $10 million or more uh, of wealth, their numbers over a 40 year period of time exploded. They increased tenfold. The population grew only by 40%. But the number of the of those deca millionaires grew tenfold. Now you would say, oh well, this is the American dream: people getting wealth and so on. Uh, what's bad about it? Well, it's good for those people, of course, but it's bad for the society. The society becomes top heavy. And what uh, is the most direct uh, problem? Well, many of those wealthy people, they are interested in competing for political offices. So think about Donald Trump, of course, is a great example, but also we have many other um, multi-billionaires or billionaires, Michael Bloomberg, and the unsuccessful ones like Steve Forbes, and so on and so forth. So now you have increased the number, the potential pool of such political aspirants tenfold. And so, but the positions, uh, you know, still one president, you know, 100 senators and so on, they have stayed constant. So suddenly we have this elite of production, a game of musical chairs, where there are huge numbers of uh, people uh, who are want to get into positions, but the positions have not changed. And so more and more people are turned away. And some of them decide to break the rules. All right, and so that's historically, this has been uh, the major driving force resulting in the rise of uh, radical revolutionary groups and uh, dissidents and so on and so forth. So this is the second problem. And let me briefly say the third problem is that now that uh, the majority of population, uh, their well-being is uh, declining uh, and the technical term for that is precarity. More and more people are uh, leading very precarious life and uh, many of them want to escape that. So if you don't have wealth, how do you escape uh, precarity? Well, you go the education route. And that's why there was a huge push factors to create more and more people with advanced degrees. Now, if you want to become a politician, there are two pipelines leading to it. One of them is uh, you, know, you use your wealth. The other pipeline is the use credentials, and the most useful credential is, of course, the law degree. Now, it would probably come as no surprise to you that a uh, huge number of famous revolutionaries, so Lenin, for example, was a lawyer, Castro was a lawyer, uh, uh, Robespierre, uh, the French Revolution was a lawyer, also um, um, uh, Gandhi was a lawyer. So. Um, so there is, uh, the lawyers are a dangerous profession. The second dangerous <laughs> profession, by the way, are teachers. Well, Mao, uh, Mao actually was a teacher before he became revolutionary. And so was 
Hong Xuchuan, the, uh, the, um, the leader of the Taiping Rebellion, which was probably the bloodiest uh, civil war in human history. As many as 50 million people probably died. Tens of millions of people died for sure. So, but anyway, back to the story in the United States, we have been uh, overproducing law uh, degrees uh, by a factor of three to one. There are three times as many new lawyers as their positions for them. All right, and so uh, the, the competition between them became very uh, fierce. So all of those three, uh, popular immiseration, overproduction of wealthy people and overproduction of youth with advanced degrees, these are all three factors that I used in my model to forecast that uh, the time of troubles to come. And it was based on our uh, extensive historical analysis of past societies. Um, this, this, is, this is this is fascinating, but I, I like to I like how you apply your model, uh, not only to, to predict the past, but you also illustrated how the model work on the past historical society. You know, for example, you, you talk about um, the, the similar wealth pump and, and growing inequality in the gilded age. Um, and you also talk about the crisis that U.S. itself experienced two times, one uh, civil war and two um, the, 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 the near collapse, the, the Great Depression that led to a progressive era. Uh, and, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Like how, where, where does the, the, the this American Civil War fall into your model of elite overproduction, public immiseration, and uh, and then the you know? Yes, um, as as, as um, in all the cases we have studied so far, elite overproduction plays a role, and the antebellum period, the period leading to the Civil War, is no exception. And the same thing, by the way, 19th century China, different types of elites but the same problem of elite of production. But let's go get back to the States. So what happened in the United States, we, uh, we had an, a period of rapid industrialization, but at the same time, uh, there was a huge labor oversupply, which drove this um, industrialization in large degree. And how did it arise? Well, first of all, the Eastern seaboard became overpopulated. The, the Connecticut, uh, the state of Connecticut, where I am right now, by 1840s became, uh, the rural areas were so overpopulated that young people had to move to the uh, cities on the Eastern board. Many of them went West, all right? But then also there was an, a massive immigration from Europe. And so as a result of that, uh, the wages started declining. And this is when the, the wealth pump got turned on. And within literally like 10 years in the uh, 1850s, the number of millionaires has increased uh, more than tenfold. It's, it was just like what we saw more recently in the United States. Suddenly, huge numbers of newly wealthy people uh, and uh, the reason uh, was very simple. Many, um, uh, many workers who were energetic, ambitious, they would start their own shops because the labor was very cheap. They could easily bootstrap themselves into the millionaire class. Just uh, a huge number of stories like that. Now, most of these people, newly wealthy people, are, um, uh, appeared in the north. Uh, especially Northwest, the old Northwest, which is the, like Chicago and the area around it, uh, Great Lakes and so on and so forth. And the ruling class at the time was the so-called slaveocracy. This was the uh, owners of plantations in the South who owned slaves and they worked them to produce uh, mostly cotton, and but also other things for, for the market. And so uh, the old ruling class was and uh, their economic um, ideas disagreed with the newly rising class of the capitalists. So those people who made money in mining, uh, manufacturing, uh, railroads, and uh, also those people wanted to have power, right? And so that's what happened. In fact, um, their, uh, their political leader um, was, um, um, uh, was Abraham Lincoln, and their vehicle was the Republican Party. 
and they managed to get Lincoln elected as a president. Uh, of course, there were all kinds. Of, uh, it was all legal, but uh, Lincoln only only got thirty eight percent of the popular vote. All right. So at that point, the southern states, uh, the old elites, seceded, and then the civil war started. Uh, the North won the civil war, and as what often happens in such situations, the old elites were destroyed. They were destroyed. Some of them were literally killed. Like forty percent of uh, southern ma males were killed on the um, battlefields and the rest of them were demoted because their wealth was taken away from them. The slaves were freed. So so this is an example of a it essentially was a social revolution in which one ruling class replaced another one. All right. Now, um, after the uh, Civil War, Initially, the elite war production was somewhat reduced because they just destroyed all the older southern elites. But uh, the wealth pump kept churning. So by 1920, uh, the United States was in another revolutionary situation. And many people don't realize how dire things were, but there were really bloody uh, race riots. There was violent labor strikes. There was, uh, in fact, a mini civil war in West Virginia when 10,000 miners armed with rifles were fighting it out with sheriff deputies and so on and so forth. It, uh, bombing campaign by anarchists and also uh, the elites in the United States were really frightened of a Bol Bol Bolshevik type revolution. And so they pulled together in one prosocial group, uh, to cut a long story short, one prosocial group led by Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his um, uh, colleagues, they persuaded the rest of the elites that they better have imposed reforms from above and save ca the capitalist um, uh, you know, uh, system rather than have a revolution from, uh, from above. So th also there was some memory because many of the people uh, during the, uh, this period, uh, this is the first three decades of the 20th century, the progressive era to the New Deal, right? Many of those people actually uh, were uh, remembered civil war. And so that helped them to avoid the same problem. But these two examples are very good because they show both how you can get to, you know, to a bloody civil war, 600,000 people killed, or you can, if the uh, elites take their um, appropriate uh, met, uh, measures, then you can avoid a civil war. Um, so uh, that leads us to today. Uh, you, you say today's United States is in another revolutionary situation. I, I tend to agree. I mean, we this is what led to, I think, the rise of Donald Trump, which you mentioned in your book. Uh, and you talk about Tucker Carlson, but I think you wrote your book just before his firing from the Fox. Um, so I don't know if you're going to update your book soon on that. Um, but you, you named Tucker Carlson as a very dangerous person because he... Uh, um, almost alone in the uh, you know, as a, a influential pundit is calling out a lot of the social ills in the United States. You know, he's he's he openly calls, uh, you know, U.S. is being ruined by its ruling class. And now the question I have for you is that, um, you know, you have the two ex historical examples where one result in civil war, another result in New Deal, where the elite form a consensus that they need to restrain them, they need to restrain themselves, restrain their greed in order to have social stability, in order to have a longer term prosperity for 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 all. Um, but right now, in to as of twenty twenty three today, I. I don't think we have we reached a position where there is a elite consensus on what to do in America, and, and, and it seems like the elite is pretty divided at this. Well, they're 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 pretty divided on social issue, but you are also right; they're pretty united when it comes down to uh, defend their very narrow self interest. That means. Uh, you know, cut taxes. <laughs> they're pretty, pretty they, they all pretty seem pretty uniform in backing uh, measures like cut taxes, um, leave their wealth alone. and and but but they're they're just fighting like social battles. That's why we're seeing the intensification of cultural war right now. So where do you see going forward? Uh, I mean, what do you does your model predict? 
Well, um, okay, again, remember the limits to predictability, but unfortunately, I must agree with you. I don't see any signs that um, our political leaders um, really understand what are the root cause of the problem. So maybe they don't want to understand it because right now all the political in fighting is between uh, is uh, one uh, side of the aisle is uh, is blaming the other and vice versa. And I want to emphasize that uh, in my approach, as you read my book, I emphasize many times that I am uh, uh, trying to be as politically neutral as possible. The reason is, is that um, knowing from the previous historical examples that the way end times end and new beginnings begin is by uh, the elites pulling together. So we need cooperation. They have to bury the hatchet and they also need to bring the population along. So we need broad based cooperation rather than blaming uh, each other. But right now, um, uh, in the last, um, you know, we, let's say uh, it became very clear that we are in crisis during the summer of 2020, when there were multiple hundreds of riots, uh, dozens of people killed, and then of course, the storming of the Capitol on, uh, in January 2021. And now we see the infighting uh, between the different elite factions taking the form of lawfare, right? So uh, Trump has been even arrested on Tuesday and then let go on. Uh, to, but uh, he, he is under several, um, you know, um, uh, 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 legal threats. And the same thing is very likely to happen. There is uh, already a movement to impeach uh, President Biden. So uh, both sides are um, using the, um, the, uh, this uh, legal uh, warfare approaches to try to gain advantage. Now, one thing is to keep in mind that neither Republicans nor Democrats are a monolithic unified party. In fact, both of them have pretty substantial um, populist uh, sector. So think about uh, Bernie Sanders in the Democratic Party, people like uh, J.D. Vance, um, a newly elected senator in the Republican Party. They are, in fact, uh, often uh, those left wing and right wing populists uh, they often say very similar things, in fact, and this is returning to uh, to uh, Tucker Carlson, uh, especially if you read his book, The Ship of Fools, which is much uh, uh, better at uh, explaining things in a calm uh, manner rather than his more sort of uh, <laughs> uh, uh, thing uh, when, he, when he was uh, on Fox News. So yes, I turned the book um, to the publisher in August of last year, and in the book I wrote that apparently uh, Rupert Murdoch is uh, uh, cares more about his, you know, about uh, you know money than about uh, the danger that Tucker Carlson. Uh, represents. And of course, I have no idea. I'm not a Freudian psychologist, so I don't know what made him change his mind. But um, I would ima I could imagine that he just got tired from his uh, colleagues in the uh, super wealthy class uh, uh, you know, harping on this uh, Tucker Carlson is, uh, needs to go and probably he eventually broke down and did that. Who knows what happened? But of course, from the point of view of, of the super wealthy class, yes, uh, getting rid of Carlson was good uh, for them because uh, he was, a, uh, you know, he was a dangerous uh, dissident, essentially, um, uh, preaching um, against the ruling class. New York Times has actually calculated what are the most common uh, tropes that uh, Carlson uses, and ru the ruling class was one of them. Um, uh, one of the three most uh, uh, frequent ones. So, um, so what's happening right now is that um, uh, in order to uh, so to go, well, let me just point. Yeah, let me just step back for a second. So, um, what we see is that um, the road to crisis seems, seems to be pretty, you know, uh, channelized. It's like a valley with narrow. Uh, vertical slopes and the ball rolling, the only one way to go. Then you get to crisis and there is a whole bunch of different roads that open. We have now uh, statistically 
quantified what is the frequency of different ro uh, roads. Some of them lead to outer collapse. Most of them lead to very substantial uh, pro problems. Lots of people getting killed, a revolution, uh, so fragmentation, political fragmentation. And then only about 10, 15% cases is like uh, the um, uh, New Deal uh, in the United States or the Chartist period in UK in the mid 19th century and, and a few others. Right, so we are right now at that cusp and I just don't see our elites uh, understanding the problem. So we need, the most important thing uh, we need to do is we need to shut down the wealth. If we do that, that first of all, that will start uh, bringing the uh, well-being of the gen of general population up. Um, secondly, it will shut down the um, the elite of production. Although that would take uh, many years, but still, this is what we need to do. I don't see any evidence of that. So the taxes are on the uh, wealthy are not being raised. The uh, minimum wage uh, continues to decline in real. Mm, uh, purchasing power, the worker uh, uh, power uh, is uh, very limited right now in so they cannot push uh, their demands. So I'm not saying that we have to do exactly the same thing that the United States did uh, in the 19, um, you know, the 20s and 30s, especially 30s during the New Deal, because the country is very different. But we know it's possible to shut down the wealth pump without a social revolution. I mean, we, and I don't see any evidence of uh, our elites uh, doing any, any of that. They're all preoccupied in the internecine infighting. Yeah, and yeah. what's interesting in your book, you talk about, it seems like it's a populist right wing that's seizing all the revolutionary potential of the masses right now. Uh, be just by the simple matter, the left is so divided. And also the Democratic Party no longer even pretends to be the party for the working class. It's it's now instead the, the party for the 10 percent, whereas the Republican Party, the traditional Republican Party is a party for the 1 percent. So you have this elite infighting at the top uh, 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 when the there's a there are huge popular discontent that's brewing from the bottom. And, and, and when they find an outlet, like in, in person, say Trump, that's when, you know, Trump just happened to be in the right place at right time or, or you know, a wrong place at wrong time, depending on your viewpoint and, and, and seizing on that potential. And, and I, I, I think Trump is only the beginning, uh, you know, because the, the, the revolutionary situation, as you as you term it, is still exists in United States. Uh, I mean, that nothing nothing has fundamentally changed. And and right now we have Carl. Tucker Carlson going on his own, you know, he is even more dangerous probably than before because he's no longer shackled by the network of Fox. Now he can say whatever he wants on on Twitter. And and, and now we have uh, so so it's 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 very interesting. I mean, like uh, 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 there are just so many topics I want to discuss with you. Uh, unfortunately, our time is is limited because we didn't even get to touch about like uh, you know the country other than United States because you use so many historical examples. You talk about the successful reformation, for example, in England that avoided uh, like the similar revolution that happened on European mainland, like 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 the French Revolution. Uh, you, you talk about the Chinese dynastic example, which is a part I really wanted to to talk to you about because for, um, from reading your book, I can see how your model applies to. Uh, the, 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 the the dynastic cycle so of China, you know, of course, and you cite, you know, apparently you 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 are very well read. You 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 cite the example, the works of Ibn Khaldun, which is like one of the earlier historians who who studies this dynastic cycle. And so and, and let describe... me ask you actually, because I, I I'm not very familiar with the current situation in China. Now that you've read the book. What do you think uh, about how uh, does it apply to China and whether many people, as you know, there is a whole like cottage industry in the uh, in the United States. Uh, every year there are 10 books published about how China is about to collapse. All right. <laughs> I don't quite see it because uh, but on the other hand, you know the situation much better. What what is your thinking about uh, what's happening in modern in contemporary China? 
Uh, well, the, the the simplest way I, I I say is you know people talking about China is gonna collapse. But but if you look at the dynastic terms, right? You know, usually a Chinese dynasty lasts about two hundred fifty to three hundred years, right? China right now is only like what seventy seventy odd years into the Red Dynasty. <laughs> the, the vitality is far from being sapped yet. And if you look at what the, the Chinese leaders are doing. Um, it, 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 for, first of all, you, you term United States as plutocracy, the yeah. rule of, of by the wealthy. That's not the case in China. China has always been ruled by a bureaucratic elite. And, and it is so today as well. It's just that instead of confusion, now it's a communist party of China bureaucracy. And, and but, but, you know, a lot of the same remains as the thing that it's it's a state that's calling the shots. You know, Jack Ma can can be the wealthiest man in China, but he does not get to set the policy to the extent the Bill Gates or uh, or or Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk does. And 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 they, you know, when 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 uh, when China when when Xi Jinping. Uh, you know, addressed on Jack Ma. Jack Ma has to have to have to bend the knee. <laughs> that that's just a real. And, and this is also how China currently is keeping. Uh, you know what Xi Jinping has done since his rise to power in 2012 can be seen in the light that he is curbing the growth of China's economic elite. He's he's putting a, a curb on the power of China's economic elite, likes of Jack Ma. You know, uh, Jack yeah, Ma. In fact, he, in fact, this is uh, returning to a traditional power configuration in imperial China, where the um, administrative elites always control the economic elites. And it was interesting again that many in the West misread this. They think that by uh, pushing down the economic elites, China is destroying its uh, future prosperity or something. But it is really returning to its, uh, you know, to its um, cultural. Uh, equilibrium, so to speak. Exactly, and and there were signs of uh, elite top elite disunity. Not like just before uh, Xi Jinping rise to power, there was a very serious uh, incident where there was a rumor of a coup, and and there was another uh, challenger in the form of. Uh, Party secretary from my hometown of Chongqing, but he has been arrested. Uh, you know that that elite infighting, for all purposes, is is over. Xi Jinping now remains in control, very much in control. And and they and, and what Xi Jinping is talking about building common prosperity. He's actually talking about redistributing some of the the wealth that has been generated in China in the last forty years to. To um to the masses, you know, I would to 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 he's he's cutting the, the wealth pump. He's redirecting some of that wealth to the to the to the people or common people of China away from people yes, like because Jack. Because over the past uh, uh, forty years or so, the um, e economic inequality in China has increased, as we know. Yes. So uh, clearly, Xi Jinping is uh, planning to reverse that um, trend. Yes, that's 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 what his policy intend to do. And uh, I know you have to go soon, but oh man, there's just so much I want to talk to you about. So I would like to invite, to extend my invitation to you right now to be a guest on my uh, show on TNT Radio, which I host every Saturday. Um, uh, um, it, it might be a little bit late for you though. It's uh, it's one to two. It's one to two p.m. Beijing time. But we can always pre-record. We can always pre-record because I know you you're you're probably on the East Coast, right? In in U.S. Uh, so yeah. we're like 12, 12 hour time difference. Uh, but I we, we can pre-record because I do want to continue our conversation. This has been a fascinating journey through history and, and science. You know, two of my passions. You 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 ticked off all my check boxes. So <laughs> I, I, I I very much would like to continue this conversation on uh yeast win with carl zhang on tnt radio um you know i'll i'll, I'll make sure i'll make the proper arrangement with your people uh, is there any uh last uh last word like if people want to reach you follow your works where do they go well um i think um we have touched on many things that i discuss in the book and times but really we could we only scratch the surface and by the way there is going to there is definitely going to be a, a simplified chinese um, uh, translation uh, pretty soon awesome 
So awesome. people will be able to read it, um, you know, in uh, Chinese. Um, and so I would just encourage them to do that. And I'm happy to come back um, and talk with you. It'll probably have to happen some months, uh, maybe in the winter or something like that. We can That's fine. talk about this uh, later because I spent uh, half a year in Vienna, which is uh, a, uh, not quite as difficult in terms of uh, time um, differential. We can talk about it later. Okay. Well, actually, I'm going to be in Russia in next couple of weeks, so maybe maybe that will be closer in the time zone. We'll, we'll figure it out. And, uh, and 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 so so your book again. Uh, let let my listener know what's your book names and where to find it. So it's called End Times: uh, Elites, Counter Elites, and the Path to Political Fragmentation. So right now, it's been it has been published both in the U.S. and in U.K. So depending on which. Uh, you, whether you, if you are in Europe, then uh, you uh, you should go to the UK um, variant. But also, um, my agent has sold rights to like ten different uh, languages, including Chinese. And so, your readers uh, will be able to to read the book uh, in uh, their native language, hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what what about your past books? I mean, like, uh, would you recommend ah, them as well? <laughs> sure. Yes. So, yeah. uh, well, first of all, uh, my previous uh, popular book is called Outer Society, and you can get it through the Amazon. Uh, that's uh, that's the the easiest way. You can get either ebook or uh, paperback through the Amazon. So, in Outer Society, I talk about the other big side of my research because I'm interested not only why large scale complex societies get into end times, but how did they evolve in the first place? All right. So, Outer Society is about that. And then, um, if you are interested in the science underlying uh, end times then i published a book in 2016 in fact it came out just two months before donald trump was elected the president it's called ages of discord you can also get it through easiest is to get it through the amazon um, and that but that one is an academic book it has tons of uh, data uh, mathematical models graphs and things like that so i don't recommend it if you want to you know, if you want just to understand um, the ideas. So I would suggest those three books, uh, uh, including End Times, for people who are interested uh, in the type of research that I and my group do. And I definitely recommend End of Times. It, it's a page turner. Uh, I, I, I finish everything in one day. So I, I highly recommend yeah. people, people. I mean, it's not just talking about United States. It's talking about a whole wide swath of world history. You know, we, we are talking about United States today just because most of my listeners, uh, you know, most of my audience are Americans. And, and the U.S. is what interests them. But uh, yeah, yeah, let's let's continue this conversation uh, in another time because well, there's just so much to, to talk about. You know, when, when you're talking about um, predicting different paths of the future uh, in your book, you, you, you cited Asimov. But I was thinking about doom. I was thinking about when like Paul Muadib, he, when, when he could see the different different futures and, and and except you know you didn't have to take large quantity of drugs <laughs> to come up with that you have a scientific model so i uh this is a fascinating conversation thank you again peter for coming to coming to silk and steel to talk about it and i hope to talk to you again on on tnt radio soon great enjoy the conversation carl okay thank you